Hi, uh, this is Dave Liebman, and uh, we're going to spend the next bunch of time discussing the process of playing the saxophone, and specifically the production of sound on the saxophone. Uh, this tape is meant for all saxophonists, regardless of idiom or style, jazz, classical, pop, studio musicians. Uh, this is I'm not going to delve into the specifics of those styles or uh, those particular uh, areas of expertise, but just about the process of playing that is common to all of us. Uh, I am known primarily as a jazz saxophonist and primarily on soprano saxophone, but for the purpose of this tape, I'm going to use the tenor because I think it's a little easier to demonstrate the principles. Uh, also, I might mention that uh, there is a book that uh, is, uh, would be a good accompaniment to this tape. It, uh, uh, it's called Developing Your Own Personal Sound, and uh, the principles that I'll be discussing and the examples are all written about in more detail in the book, but of course the benefit of the tape is that you can see the positions and hear the sound and the exercises. Uh, before I go any further, uh, I, I must mention that the source of my material comes primarily from my, my master, my teacher through the years, Mr. Joe Allard. Uh, he was associated for years with Juilliard School of Music, Manhattan School of Music, and New England Conservatory, and has taught all many, many, many famous jazz musicians, classical musicians, and all sorts of people who have come from all over the world to study with Joe. Uh, his principles uh, apply to all types of saxophone players, and uh, he was a main inspiration for me, really, to even get into discussing these kinds of principles. Uh, what the tape is about are really my uh, interpretations of many of his principles, some of his very exercises, uh, and mostly uh, the sequence of and the order of events of the presentation is more of my own, but uh, this tape is dedicated to the teachings of a great, great master, Will Alwood. Uh, before going specifically into the saxophone, I want to talk generally about some musical things and um, some things about just playing an instrument in general. Um, I think that any instrumentalist, regardless of what instrument he's playing, she is playing, is attempting to find a balance uh, with the horn of technique and instinct uh, of mind and body, if you like. Uh, there are three aspects to playing. There's the mind, thought, there is the ear and the emotions, which is more of the instinctual and psychological aspects. And then, of course, there are the technical aspects, and that's what we're really going to be concentrating on here, that part of the triad. Uh, what an instrumentalist is looking for, again, no matter what style of music he's playing, or she is playing, is trying to find that inner voice, that sound in the instrument that would be uniquely his own. Uh, it is a way of connecting up with your instrument that it becomes like a third arm. Uh, it is something that when you play your instrument, it should be as natural as tying your shoelaces, brushing your teeth in the morning, something you don't have to think about in the fact, in the aspect of producing the sound. This should be something that flows and is easily, easily accomplished so that the energies can be spent on creativity, listening, being sensitive to the other musicians and all the many, many, many activities that take place when you are playing music. Uh, even more specifically, I think an instrumentalist is trying to find how to mold a sound, how to color a sound, how to express his own feelings or tell a story even through a sound. Or great, great musicians can tell so much through even only one note, as I'm sure you know. Uh, the Chinese have a very poetic way of describing what should be evident in a beautiful sound. They say that these qualities should be there. Um, happiness, elegance, sadness, sweetness, subtlety, resonance, and strength. And I think this is a beautiful way of describing the, well, you might say the emotional characteristics that are inherent in a sound 
and are there to be manipulated. Uh, alongside those wonderful ways of describing a sound are some more mundane terms that musicians would use to describe somebody's tone or to describe their own sound. Well, my sound is bright. Uh, his sound is dark. Uh, that sounds nasal, piercing, shimmering, velvety, lush, floating, and on and onward with words. And of course, it only points out to the inadequacy of language to describe an oral picture. But we, we do the best we can. And uh, you'll see throughout the tape that what I'm really doing is describing something in my own vocabulary. And of course, the goal of any musician, instrumentalist, is to find his own way of speaking about sound. Um, what we're going to try to accomplish by the end of this tape is, depending on what level you're you are playing at. If you're a beginner, well, this is a very good place to start, I, th I think. Uh, if you're already playing, what this tape may uh, benefit, f benefit you will be in relieving, possibly relieving some bad habits or some tensions that are in your playing that contribute to possibly a constrained sound or a sound that is not as free and as flexible and as expressive as you would like. And possibly by one or two of the exercises of the many that I'm going to show you, you will find a way to be able to practice uh, more relaxation in blowing and therefore make more room for creativity and your own personality to come forth. The process works pretty much like this. One hears a sound in his inner ear, pre-hears a sound if you like, and this message of intention, the pitch, the way the note should be played from fortissimo to pianissimo, the quality, the color, the nuance of the sound, this is all heard beforehand, maybe not note by note per se, maybe it's a group of notes, but there is a pre-hearing going on which sends a message to that part of the body involved, through the brain, through the nervous system, through the reflex actions and so forth, to the muscles involved. It's as if I say, well, I'm going to go over here and pick up a pencil. Well, that was a message. It began as a brain brain message. Well, in this case, it's going to be, well, I'm going to play an A. And that's going to mean I'm assuming certain positions. First of all, I'm going to finger an A, of course. But we're going to assume certain positions in our body that will enable that A to come out. And that is really how specific we're going to get. And my contention is that if you would scientifically almost analyze every note, there is a slightly different position of the parts I will describe for each particular note. And by uh, analyzing this way, you get to a place where you almost feel a note as you hear it. And then it becomes automatic. Uh, there is, I think, um, misconception, or depends on how one is taught, or some people, of course, are self-taught on the saxophone, uh, that most of the work in playing the saxophone takes place at the Amishore area. When I refer to the Amishore area, I mean the lips and the teeth and the jaw and all the things occurring in the mouth area. And really, this is not completely correct. There is a certain amount of activity that must, by the nature of acoustics, occur at the reed, uncovering and covering of the reed. And we will discuss that in detail later. Uh, that's achieved in the bottom lip, and uh, we'll, we'll discuss that as I say. But this is a minimal type of action. Most of the activity is taking place in the voice box, in the larynx or laryngeal area. And in a way, you could think of the playing of the saxophone as uh, two mouthpieces being constantly adjusted. One is the mouthpiece and reed, opening and closing of the reed and the area of reed surface on the lip. And uh, another uh, area or a mouthpiece, if, if you like, that is being adjusted is the larynx. As I speak, as I sing, I play. In fact, if you picture the saxophone in a, in a way visually, the saxophone is an extension of the body. It is almost a mirror image of where it comes from. Here is the abdomen area where the air begins, and we will discuss breathing. It's kind of an open area. It comes into a tube, right, through the air column, through the throat, the pharynx, if you like, into the mouth cavity, and the tongue is, is in there. Of course, then the amateur parts and the teeth and the lips and the jaw and all the action up here. And then finally, the transitional part between the human being, between myself and the instrument, is the mouthpiece itself. The air enters and does its number on the mouthpiece and the reed. And then it goes through the bore and it does its last thing, which is, of course, depending on where I finger, 
comes out to that hole and affects the frequency. Now, in a certain way, you could almost say that the sound is predetermined before I put my fingering down. Uh, I put down a B, but I have already the predetermined the way that B will sound by my manipulation of airstream and of the reed before it even gets to the instrument. The instrument is a reinforcement of what I've already intended to do, and well, obviously it makes me allows me to play music and move fast and do all the things we do when we play music. So what uh, we're going to follow in the course of this tape is the airstream as as a voyage down a, a river with stops along the way, beginning in the abdomen area, working its way up to the chest, and the shoulders into the larynx, larynx area, oral cavity, uh, embouchure, and then we'll talk about the reed and the mouthpiece. Now before we finish the section, I'm going to play a little bit, and I want you to, uh, more than listen, of course, you'll be listening, but I want you to watch what you see, what kind of action you see me doing here in relation to whether I go high or low, loud or soft, depending on what I play. And as you watch here, also, Watch what goes on in the throat area, and I'll ex exaggerate my position a little bit so you can see. <laughs> You should see not too much movement here. Sometimes a little more of the lip is put on to get a subtone. Sometimes a little bit, little bit less is to get more volume. These are ver varieties of uh, surface area of the bottom lip, which we will discuss separately. But for the most part, the work is happening in the larynx. Okay, we uh, will begin this journey of the hair stream at its source, which is breathing, how to take a good, deep, breath and get efficient uh, breathing mechanism. In the normal activities of life, uh, what is ordinarily needed as far as air capacity is about 70 to 80 percent or one pint of air. Uh, this is sufficient for most people and most normal people, uh, this is about what they use throughout their whole life and they breathe mostly through the top part of their body. If you say to somebody breathe, you'll see and that'll be about it. But for people who use their uh, voice and the airstream as part of what they do, athletes, anybody public speaking, or actors, and of course woodwind players, brass players, uh, vocalists, we need to have more near 100% of capacity, as much as possible, and about or equal to around a quart of air. So it's important that we learn to breathe efficiently, in a relaxed way, and of course, second nature becomes something that is habit because you can't think about breathing before, while you're playing. This would be very bad. Uh, there are a few obvious benefits of breathing. One is, of course, for loud passages and uh, being able to compete with, well, in our day and age, electric instruments in some cases. Um, but more so for long passages, and especially for jazz musician who's improvising and is not really uh, sure when he starts his phrase exactly when it's going to end. It's very, very advantageous to have the air there so he can use it. Uh, but outside of loudness and uh, length of, of uh, uh, phrase, uh, another important reason has to do with uh, the body of a note, especially in the higher register of the instrument. Now, it's not as apparent on the tenor as it would be on a higher instrument uh, or on the flute, but uh, it's very obvious on the flute is what I'm saying above high C. You can hear that when a shallow breath is taken, by shallow, I mean this ordinary breath on the top part of the body. When a shallow breath is taken, the sound is not as full and as deep as when a more deeper diaphragmatic breath, what we're going to discuss, is taken. So I'm going to play a few notes in both ways. First, shallow breath. <laughs> Now a deeper breath. Mm -hmm. 
should feel uh, and hear a little bit more fullness to the sound, I hope. Um, let's talk a little bit about general principles of breathing. Uh, this has to do with air flowing into an empty, non-resistant chamber, which it will naturally do. So our whole intention here, this chamber is the chest cavity, our whole intention in breathing is to empty it and expand it so that the air can come in. It sounds very easy, but the truth is that breathing involves around 30, 35 separate muscle, muscle actions, and it's a little bit complicated to get the timing correct. Now, we're not going to go down to each muscle, but we're going to show the process in general ways, which has to do with the flow of the air from the bottom uh, abdomen area up through uh, the lungs and the upper chest and coming out through the, through the mouth. Uh, the diaphragm is an important part. It's an important muscle, and it's often referred to. Teachers, uh, you'll, say, you'll see in vo voice instructors particularly, will say, use your diaphragm, use your diaphragm. And I think what they're really referring to is to use your abdomen to increase your air capacity. Because the diaphragm is not something you can actually feel. I mean, I can point to the area of the diaphragm. It's somewhere between the rib cage down here. It is a dome-shaped muscle that goes up and down according to what I'm doing. When I inhale, it is going down, allowing the rib cage to expand, like so. And when I exhale, it goes up and the air comes out, push the air out. Now, what we want to do, though, is find the area that the diaphragm is and see if we can feel this particular area. And this is in here. This is the abdomen. It's shaped much like a donut. And the idea in the abdomen is to have it expand and contract just like I'm doing with my hands, uh, much like a bellows works. So what we're going to do is we're going to find each of the main areas of breathing uh, by a specific way. First of all, before we start specifically, just to have you feel the chest cavity expanding and contracting, just put your arms uh, locked over your head and slowly lower them down and you can feel just by the action, the chest contracting and expanding. Okay, this is a basic identification exercise, if you like. Okay, now to find this abdomen area and really feel it uh, for some reason, I guess because it compacts the body. Anyway, it seems that when we bend over, put our hands down on this area, right around the rib, right on the the love tires, as they're sometimes called, love handles. Excuse me. Um, you should breathe, try to breathe through your stomach or abdomen and feel it expanding and contracting and slowly raise up and see how long you can keep it going. Through the nose, out the mouth. Now, of course, as you get straighter, you start to, the feeling starts to fade away. And one of our great challenges here in in this three-part breathing that I'm going to describe is to feel the abdomen in this straight position, the normal position of playing. So uh, this is just a very good way to find it so you can identify it. Now the second part of the three-part breathing is the middle lungs or chest area and in order to define that specifically we're going to lie down. Lying on the floor I can also exaggerate the diaphragmatic breathing. Watch this. Put my hands on this area. You can really see it expand in this way. This is more an up and down. Before it was more of an uh, outward and inward motion. Remember, we are really observing here the effects of a particular uh, aspect of breathing on the body. We can only observe the body effects. That's how we know we're doing it. Now, diaphragmatic breathing is the most effective breath if done only alone. It is the deepest and uh, gives the most capacity. The second part of the three-part breath, uh, and if done alone, is not as good and takes quite a bit of blood power and circulation to do, is the chest area. Now, I can demonstrate this specifically pinpointed by watching the effect on the body. If I raise the buttocks, put my hand around this area and breathe. And you can see what we call chest breathing. 
Okay. Now we're going to go to the third part, third part of the breath, which alone would be just the upper part of the uh, chest or upper shoulders, clavicular breathing. Another way to identify the clavicular area is the collarbone or shoulder area. And you can see this uh, area being used very easily when you are out of breath and you have to pant as this. <laughs> and that shows you the third part of the breath. And obviously it's not a quite efficient, but to be used in emergencies. Now, the point of showing you the three areas is that what we're going to do in order to practice this is to put it into one even form, even smooth flowing motion from bottom to top. Uh, this is called the yogic breath. This is a uh, basic breathing exercise of yoga. Uh, there are many, many variants of this. Some people use counting in order to be uh, for the inhaling and the exhaling. Usually inhaling would be uh, half of exhaling. For example, if I do four beats of inhaling, I would do hold for, for maybe four beats or eight beats, whatever's comfortable, and blow out eight beats. In other words, doubling exhale is double inhale because inhale is a little bit shorter of a, a cycle. But in any way, I won't do for counting for this purposes because it's not as formal as in yoga. Uh, what I'm going to show you is three-part breathing, and I'm going to call off the areas. And I will say one for abdomen, two for chest, and three for clavicles. And do it in that way. Hold the breath for a little bit and blow out. And blowing out will be a, a sort of a reverse of this. I will be, you'll see the shoulders slightly lower, the chest relaxed. And finally, most important, I will pull the abdomen in in order to expel as much air as possible. So real work that is involved here, if there is any work at all, because eventually there shouldn't be a, the notion of work, it should be an even relaxed flow, but any kind of activity that's involved has to do with that pushing in and out of the abdomen, sort of what I was doing when I was on the ground. So first, one, two, three, exhale. Three, two, one, in. Now, I really try to push my stomach out and in to get this full breath. Try not to tense up when you do it, the shoulders. Just feel pretty relaxed up there. Stand straight, evenly on your uh, heels, heels and soles. And uh, try to do five to ten breaths, maybe twice a day. It's very nice to start off in the morning with this. This is a very good way to start the day. Uh, regardless of whether you're a saxophonist or not, it's a relaxing. It provides uh, good circulation for your body and the blood. Uh, I think uh, everybody in normal life is aware of how when you're in an emergency situation or under duress or pain or uh, some kind of stressful situation, uh, somebody with you or a doctor will say, take deep breaths. That will calm you, relax. Uh, a woman who is in labor learns how to breathe. It's always very good because it relaxes the body. It's just for well-being. So first of all, it's just good to do in the beginning of the day and then maybe towards the uh, end part of the day in the evening before you go to bed or before you practice. Try to do five to ten deep breaths like this. Slowly, eyes closed, stand up and see how you can get this to really go in a smooth motion. Now, of course, when you're actually playing, it's not going to be so dramatic as this. So we're trying to get accustomed to this way of breathing so that it becomes second nature and you become habitual, habitual, uh, habituated to it and uh, don't have to think about it. Now, i uh, devise a few different ways to practice uh, this breath in order to um, exaggerate it and make you a little bit stronger, a little bit more aware of it. In other words, what we're going to do is place basically resistance on our abdomen and try to build up the muscular power in here. Okay, again, do your deep breathing, three-part breathing, lying flat on the floor. See if I can get a space in here. I really pull my abdomen in. Okay, and finally, as the 
most form of resistance, we just lay some kind of heavy weights, start off with some books, telephone books, whatever you have around, eventually uh, anything. You can have a person try to sit on top of you or push down on you. You're trying to get this diaphragm area as strong as possible. So you're just using resistance and do the same thing. And increase the weight gradually. Okay, I want to emphasize the need for regularity of breathing exercises and to do it with concentration and slowly. It should be the only thing you're doing at that moment, no distractions. Uh, it's a very relaxing to do and uh, it's something that if you get in the habit of doing every day for the rest of your life would not be of any harm, believe me. Um, but for the, our specific aspects of uh, playing the saxophone is something to do now as you see this tape and start doing and see if you are really breathing as deeply as you can. Make it feel good and after a while it will become habitual. Uh, the main point is to get this diaphragm area, abdomen area to move in and out and to feel really hard and secure. Uh, I'll tell you a nice story about Miles Davis who I worked with in the, in the mid-70s, uh, standing a few feet away from him and watching him play. I was always amazed at how hard his diaphragm area would become, his abdomen would become, even when he played a short note. It wasn't necessarily for a long phrase when you would expect it. Uh, he had a very, very hard uh, surface here. And uh, he used to, of course, you know, he was into boxing in that, in that time and uh, training and everything. And I think he, he, he realized that it was important to have a very strong center of uh, uh, energy and power here. This is a very important part of the body. In fact, when I would go see him, uh, oftentimes after that, after I was with him, the uh, first thing he would do when I'd come in is he'd give me like a quick right jab over here and just check out my uh, well-being or my health. It was kind of a funny thing, but uh, what it was was he's seeing that you, you feel good and that you're healthy. So uh, diaphragmatic breathing is very important, okay? Now we're going to move on to the air stream is now, we have a good air stream, a good air supply, and it now is approaching the area of the larynx and the throat. The throat gullet is the tube that begins in the stomach and winds its way through the chest and lungs and out into the oral cavity. And in different areas of this tube, it has different anatomical names. Uh, the area we're concerned with is that part of the throat gullet that is open, and that is the larynx. Now, the larynx is basically near the Adam's apple as far as being able to identify it on the outside, but if we look inside at a diagram, we see here a diagram from the side. This is your nasal cavity. Here are your teeth, top teeth, and your top lip and bottom lip, and the tongue. And then right in back, we have this tube coming up, which in one area is called the esophagus, and later becomes the pharyngeal, pharyngeal wall, which is the inflamed area when you have a sore throat. Uh, here is the soft palate, the back of the roof of your mouth. And what we're concerned with here is the laryngeal ventricle. Here's the larynx over here, and these two sides of it, you can see a little opening, are the vocal cords or lips or folds. These are interchangeable words which I'll use throughout. And it is these, the movement of these vocal cords, which we will be specifically talking about. Uh, what happens with them is that the tension and the length of the vibrating points of these vocal folds are regulated, and this results in a periodic and varying modulation of the steady airflow, which is the breath, the source, and finally resulting in pitch differences as the vocal cords vibrate. This is the same mechanism that works for speaking, as for singing, as for blowing, and it is the same mechanism for a newborn baby crying as it is for a mature adult. A little bit more on the vocal cords and the kind of action that they actually go through. They are what give emotional expression to our utterances. And these vocal cords, looking at it from the side, remember here it's actually looking at it from a top view, but from the side, they, uh, the muscular action is a result of four basic natural movements, uh, expansion and contraction, elongation and shortening. And this, the variety of these movements and the percentages of which it, it may contract versus expanding or it may elongate versus shortening, have to do with the particular 
uh, expression or let's say the particular sound that we're looking for. Remember it is the inner ear with the brain sending a message to that part of the body to do the necessary work to get out the sound and this is what's occurring in the vocal cords. Now if you play one note from a pianissimo to a fortissimo in that range your vocal cords will go through all these four movements very clearly. Uh, this movement feeds the air pulses into the vocal tract at different frequencies of vibration. Some tones are attenuated, others are accentuated, and this results in infinite numbers of sounds and in turn, infinite number of expressive colors. The only thing about this is that this muscular action occurs below the threshold of conscious feeling. This means that I can't consciously feel it happening. I can't consciously give it a command and, and have it occur. What, what we can do though is via an exercise and uh, via the results, the oral results and the feeling results, we can see the action or feel and hear the action of the vocal cords at work. And this is the overtone exercises which we'll get to later. But before we do that, we have to spend a little bit of time on other aspects of holding the saxophone, uh, specifically the embouchure area, which have an effect on the larynx and the position of the larynx. Uh, by now you should be realizing that it's a very sensitive uh, area, this larynx and vocal cords, and any kind of activity or position that places tension on it is going to inhibit its uh, ability to act. So for example, if I see a saxophone is playing with their head very far down or very far up, either way exaggerated, is going to probably make it more difficult for the larynx to uh, operate at full potential. Uh, you can try this just by speaking uh, and try uh, speaking your voice in those positions and listen to the difference in sound and you, you'll see what I mean. Uh, now, the next problem that can occur by a position, a wrong position, has to do with the lower lip and this is very, very important. As I said earlier, the lower lip uh, is doing some kind of adjusting at the reed and is uh, very important as to how the sound will come out and the register and so forth. But before we even talk about the proper position uh, as far as the reed goes, the first thing to realize is that many people, uh, when they play with the lip in this position, like this, folded over the teeth in that way, they are placing pressure on the larynx. Uh, even if you just do it as I am, and put your hand around the Adam's apple, you can feel some tension. It's very little, but it's enough to upset the cart. But let's talk a little bit further about why it is more favorable to have the lower lip in a more, what I call, fatter position, with more skin area on the reed. The lower lip works uh, very much like the felts on the hammers of the piano. Uh, the felts cover the hammer, which hits the string, and softens the it cushions the uh, percussiveness of it and the vibration. And the lip, like the felt, both do the same thing, which is they absorb the extreme high and percussive overtones, therefore allowing the fundamental to come forth. Now, you know, a tone is made up of a fundamental and its overtones, and the fundamental is the source of the sound. We'll, we'll, we'll get to this a little bit later. Uh, so, it's very important to have this lip area on the reed for that reason. Now, there's another very important reason, which is the kind of movement that's necessary at the reed. Due to the acoustics of the reed, it's a very simple uh, thing that you can understand. Just watch my thumb as being the bottom of the reed. Bottom, my bottom lip, excuse me. Here is the way my bottom lip would be for low notes. What am I doing? I'm covering the reed, mostly. For high notes, I tend to do this, which uncovers the edge of the reed and allows more of the higher overtones to come out, which is more of the higher pitch, higher sound. And as we go higher, the frequencies are higher. This movement at the reed is what I spoke of earlier as being the adjustments necessary. The larynx is first, but this is a natural thing. So this is something that you don't even have to think about. When you first took the saxophone up and played the first day, you probably didn't even think about the fact that you naturally went like this for high notes. 
and like this with all notes. Mm. Now I'm exaggerating, but it basically gives you this kind of motion. A rolling motion. Now, if I have my lip over my teeth like this, then how am I going to do it? I can only go kind of moving the saxophone, which is very awkward. So it is the outer rim, which is on the reed, yeah, the high notes, and the inner rim, that for the low notes. So we want to get this rolling motion. Uh, the thing about the bottom lip is that, of course, everybody's teeth and lip and jaw is different. So it's very, very hard to tell somebody else to put the position in a certain place. In fact, I used to spend time, I have a picture here of one of my favorites. Pictures here, I used to spend time in, with a mirror looking at this picture of John Coltrane on this album and many other albums, but it's particularly good to see his album sure, and trying to, like with a magnifying glass, look in here and see exactly how much lip John Coltrane had on his bottom uh, extended on the reed. Of course, this is a little bit fruitless because there's no way that I could get it. I'm not John Coltrane and uh, we don't have similar lips and you don't have similar lips to mine. So I have a, there's a system that uh, Joe used to use actually to uh, help you find it and it's by using the letter V as in victory or F as in first. And when you say these two letters, especially V, you realize that your top teeth strike your bottom lip somewhere in the middle of the fleshy area. V, 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 V. So what I try to do is imagine an imprint being made. Now this is also very good to use a mirror. Look at the mirror, do V, V, V. Mm -hmm. There's an imprint. And where that imprint would be is where I will try to play my middle register. C, for example. V, V. <laughs> And of course, from there, high notes will be and low notes will be. Okay, so V is a good way of discovering where your central spot is from which you will be going in and out, moving in and out. Now, a good, a good way to practice this is to try to measure, a, at least on a tenor, about one inch in. About an inch, a little less. Put your teeth there. You try to roll in and out. You still keep the spot. That's how I'm doing. Just to feel the movement. It's a rolling motion. Sometimes uh, uh, saxophonists have a little problem with their bottom teeth being jagged and uh, cutting into their bottom lip. Uh, and this is something that depends on your teeth, and it could be a problem, and uh, you might go to your dentist, and they can very easily shave down a certain amount of the teeth. Uh, after a certain amount, it's not uh, healthy to do. Or you, if you're brave, as uh, Joe Allen did to me one day, you take an emery board, and you might lightly go in and take off a little bit, but I would be very careful about that, depending on how sharp it is. Or if it's really a problem on an on a everyday level, take a little bit of cigarette paper and fold it into several squares, as so. Of course, wet it first, and then place it over your teeth like this, and you can play with it on your bottom teeth, and there's a panning. So there are ways of getting around this. Sometimes you just have to build up a callus and get used to it. There's no other way to it. I used to have some problems, especially on soprano, which is very tight on, for sure, uh, for the first few days of playing until I built up a callus, and then it became okay. So, this is the uh, adjustment of the bottom lip, fatter bottom lip, try to have it be out, and you will hear a difference in sound between thin and thick bottom lip. Here is thin. And here is thicker. That's an incontestable difference, and I dare say that a 99% of players who come to me with a thin lip, if I have them put their lip out there, sound immediately expands and gets richer and deeper. Okay, we will uh, continue on with the embouchure elements now. We're going to t talk a little bit about the teeth. Now, I have digressed a little from the larynx, and we will return to it, but it's important to cover this while we're in this area of the uh, mouth. We kind of skip the airstream from the larynx and the oral cavity up to the mouth and read, but uh, we'll make up for it. 
First of all, the upper teeth are in a natural bite. They are receiving the lowers. This is your natural bite. You don't have to worry about the upper teeth. Uh, I play, the way I play, I put sometimes a little too much pressure on the upper teeth, and I find that I get an indentation here. The uh, truth is that shouldn't be too much of an indentation. That probably means that you're weighing too heavily downward with your head pressure and uh, uh, pushing your teeth into the top of the mouthpiece. And that's going to be no good, as is the opposite, which would be biting up too much. The lowers are basically, lower teeth are basically, for the most part, placed opposite the beginning of the facing. The beginning of the facing is where the reed and mouthpiece part. That's the beginning of the facing, the lay area, L-A-Y. And about there is where my teeth would be, of course, through my bottom lip. So I could feel the reed through my lip with my teeth if I thought about it. The motion of the jaw, the bite itself, is a very simple motion, just like chewing. Or another way to explain it is when you pronounce the, uh, the uh, word, or not the word, the the letters EX, you say X, 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 CHU. Very simple upward motion. Uh, it's a known physical law of Newton that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Well, here it is the action and the weight of the head and an opposite and equal reaction of the bottom jaw. And it should be not tighter or looser than it has to be. It should be firm but relaxed. When I play, you put your fingers around here, you will feel firmness, but not tension. Not like this. Relax. Finally, a uh, few things to do to check the bites and see if it's not too much is to try to place the thumb of the right hand under the jaw, one finger in the mouth, and play with the left hand, high and low, and just check that it's not too tight. Also along the same lines, the corners of your mouth. Some people curl the corners of their mouth. And this is very bad because this closes up the reed. Now, you know the reed has to hit evenly on the tip and on the two rails of the mouthpiece. So if I'm closing up here, biting the reed, it's not going to be able to vibrate. So I want to be careful not to have a curled corners, not to have a bunching up in the jaw, and not to have too much pressure up or down. It's really, as I said before, a matter of trying to keep this whole embouchure area loose and relaxed and let most of the work occur in the larynx and the vocal cords with the auxiliary uh, obvious and acoustically right phenomenon of the bottom lip controlling the reed as necessary. Uh, a good way to practice this is similar. Take two fingers and place them, or maybe these two fingers, in the corners of your mouth and practice for maybe five, ten minutes just playing long tones with the left hand with the fingers in the corners of your mouth. And then after you take it out, you will feel the tension or lack of tension, hopefully, after doing it for a while. This is a good way to relax. Yeah, kind of like this. This is a good exercise for uh, uh, doing that. Okay, so I think we've covered pretty much the embouchure area. Now we're going to go to the overtone exercises and really try to get some concrete ways of practicing this feeling in the lens. Uh, before enumerating the exact exercises and uh, how they work and demonstrating, uh, we should first understand what the point of exercises is. Uh, the point is to exaggerate something in order to find a middle course. Uh, you play very, very loud and very, very soft in order to be able to play at the more commonly used mezzo volume. You play very, very fast tempos and very, very slow tempos which will enable you to be a little easier at the middle tempos. Well, in this case, we're going to do exaggerated exercises 
uh, some that would probably never be used, except in order to get this larynx and the vocal cords to operate in a way so, so extreme that when they actually go to the saxophone, it'll feel like a piece of cake. Okay? Um, remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get our vocal cords to operate in a more accurate, more ease, uh, uh, and quicker to our imagination than before, and we're going to have exercises in order to be able to demonstrate, over, uh, uh, to demonstrate vocal cord movement, because it occurs below the threshold of feeling, and there's no other way to measure it except by the oral results, musical results. First of all, just speaking is a great demonstration of vocal cord use. Speaking loud, speaking softly, speaking high, and speaking low. I'm immediately using my vocal cords in extreme positions. The extension of speaking, vocalizing, singing. All you have to do is sing a scale or an interval, put your hand around your Adam's apple, and you'll feel vibration. This is the vocal cords at work, for sure. And you can even see the movement. You see a kind of raising or opening up. Well, it is the manifestation of that contraction, expansion, elongation, shortening uh, movement that I spoke about earlier. It's all those things happening in different rates and different proportions, but they are all occurring as I hear the sound in my ear. Now, after the, the, the vocalization, the next thing, of course, is to go to the saxophone. And even before we go to the actual horn, we're going to play on the mouthpiece alone. Now, this is uh, very exaggerated because what we're going to be doing is, in a sense, creating the feeling of a bore of fingerings, but without the fingerings. I'm going to be doing it completely in my throat. This is very important. This is the link between the voice and the body and the horn. This is the best way to show it. Uh, you should be aware, of course, that playing the mouthpiece alone is not the most musical sound in the world. A little bit like a kazoo gone crazy, and uh, I would... I would beg you to practice this in a quiet place and away from other people unless you want them to uh, chase you away. Because it's a little bit annoying after a while. But it's something that uh, I feel is important to do right at the beginning of practicing, even uh, before you go to the saxophone. After some breathing exercises, go right to the mouthpiece. And the first thing to do is remember to use the bottom lip in the position we spoke of earlier. That V position, a good fat lip on the reed. Remember that spot we said about an inch, an inch in? Being able to cover up almost everything except leaving a little bit open, like an eighth of an inch, which you would for, for very high notes, right? Low notes. No, no, I, I didn't mention this before, but of course the most skin that would be covering the reed would be on subtone, all right? So we can really go from over here all the way to here, okay? Anyway, find that place, and then first play some sounds. Just sounds, don't worry about the pitches necessarily. You do that for a few minutes. What you're really doing here is the calisthenics. It's like a runner or an athlete before they go to their real workout, whatever their sport is, they do stretches and pulls and pushes and things just to get their muscles to stretch. Well, we are stretching our main muscle here, if you like. We are getting the vocal cords to move around in just some random way just to get them going, get them active. Now, I will try to be a little bit more specific about playing, and what I'll do is find the highest note I can at the beginning, and see if I can play a major scale. At least, see if I can get as far as an octave. So, let's see what note I find. Oh, it's a concert, eh? That's not bad. See if I can get a little bit lower. almost down to the F sharp. How about if I can extend the range a little bit higher and then get even a wider range? See if I can get up to B flat. Uh, almost down to the F, okay? Now, if I work on this for a few days and do it a few minutes each day, I will see that my range starts to expand. I had a, 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 one of my uh, cohorts in Italy 
uh, he's a teacher, but he was the first time he took lessons with me it was a couple of years ago, and I gave him this one of the lessons involved this, and I went back a year later, and this man could do two and a half octaves. He went all the way down. It was incredible. He had really stretched his muscles amazingly. So I know that a lot can be done with this. This is very, very good. Now after you know you do a scale, you can then go and try to do some, have some fun, do some intervals, do some uh, different scales. It could be a Phrygian or a diminished scale. It's up to you what you want to use. In other words, this is really ear training. Play with your ear, use the piano to check, so you're actually kind of practicing another thing here. Uh, let's say we do a, a mm, let's say a uh, Dorian scale, which would be this. Okay. And I can have some fun with this. So it's something that you can really get a lot out of, including ear training. You should be able to get the range of an octave or about a tenth after a few days of doing this. If you can't, this is a very good indication of the possibility that the reed is too hard or too soft, or the opening of the mouthpiece is too small or too big. We'll discuss this later when we talk about mouthpieces, but you know, if it's too small an opening or too soft a reed, that means that you're going to be closing it up before you get to a very high note. And if it's too large an opening or too hard a reed, then you're going to have trouble getting down in a low register. This is, uh, this is very obvious. And this kind of tells you a little bit about your mouthpiece and reed combination, whether it's proper for you. You should be able to get an, uh, at least an octave, if not a tenth, after a while. Now we're going to go to the horn. And before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about the harmonics and overtone series. You all know from your musical uh, exercises that the overtone series is uh, a series of notes that occurs in nature, where there is a fundamental and a uh, certain pattern of notes follows uh, all the way up 16 times. The first overtone is octave, and then the fifth, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we're going to use this overtone uh, series to, uh, to to check our larynx out. Now, the the way we do it is we're using the harmonic series in combination with the acoustics of the horn, in other words, fingerings, uh, to portray a sense of the laryngeal adjustments and positions needed. Uh, one, one thing I want to quote is uh, Hemholtz, he was a great theoretician of this thing, of acoustics, and he said that the differences of tone color that come up actually come from combinations of different intensities of a tone's partials. And the partials are what make up the sound. This is why you can have the same note played on a clarinet and the same note played on a trumpet and close your eyes and not see it and know it's a different instrument, even though it's the exact same pitch. It's the color differences. It, it, in, in our case, what we're interested in is the movement of the vocal cords in combination with the reed vibration and in combination with the fingerings on the bore or the two, the saxophone itself, which will serve altogether to emphasize or de-emphasize the frequencies and partials. And what we get is colors. What we get is a variety of sounds and colors besides the pitches themselves, the A, the G, and the F, we get different kinds of colorings, shadings, nuance, expressive uh, uh, devices. All the things that I spoke about that make up music become very, very uh, applicable and easy to do once you start to get this larynx to do the work and get the motion out of the mouth and get things to relax. So we will turn to the overtone exercises now. We now turn to the overtone exercises. The fundamental rationale is that by playing the fundamental tone, in this case, we begin with B flat, B as a fundamental, C, C sharp, and D. By using this fingering and hearing the note in our inner ear, we will get the overtone series. First overtone, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh in some cases, less on the other notes as it goes higher. You're using the bottom notes for this. These are the fundamentals. The premise is that if I hear the note strong enough in my ear, and I, in a sense, sing the note, it will be the same as vocalizing it. The air column will take its proper direction. I do not even have to change fingerings, and I can get the overtone I'm looking for. So what we're looking for here is to play a low B-flat and to, to get this. So it will be his singing. <laughs>
this is what I want to do on the saxophone. So we're going to do it very slowly. We try to do it as smoothly as possible, legato, at a nice natural volume, not too loud, not too soft. If there is difficulty in getting the overtone, this one, if I have trouble with that, doing it a few times on any one of the notes, B flat or B or C, you know, a way to help and kind of cheat your way through and get to it quickly is to play the real fingering for that note and quickly, without a, a stop in the breath, switch to the overtone fingering. And this will give you the feeling of the note. So, for example, if I'm having trouble getting, I play actual B flat with this fingering, and I go right to it. Or let's say I had trouble getting the second overtone off of B flat, this one. I can't get it, I say. I'm having a lot of difficulty. I go. And in that way, I help myself. So let me go up the overtone series here. To the second one. I'm going from a. Off of this. And then the third. Notice up here in my embouchure, watch as I do it, that you see not that much movement, just enough movement at the reed that we spoke about earlier, but you really see this larynx moving around. We're going now for the, uh, I guess, the fourth one. Now I'll go for the fifth. Six, which is a flat. And the six, uh, seventh, excuse me, high B flat. Okay, and I would do the same series, uh, let's say on C sharp, for example, fundamental. Second. Third. Okay, next part of the exercise is to just go back from the overtone to the fundamental. Uh, let's do C. So I'm going to go fundamental, first overtone, fundamental. Second overtone. Let's go B to B, B to the third overtone. This is how you practice this first part of the exercises. Do them slowly, do one overtone at a time. B flat, first overtone, B first overtone, C, C sharp, D is not for the first overtone because it's just the octave, there's no difference in fingering. Spend maybe a couple of weeks on the first overtone until it starts to feel really natural. Sing the notes before you do it. Go to the natural fingering or the real fingering for that note and see if the feeling is similar. You will find after a while that slowly you get to a point where you begin to feel differences between these notes and you're going to have a real feeling for what it feels like to play an F off of the B-flat fingering. What it feels like to play a C with a C fingering. Okay? Now, this is just the beginning. The next part is the matching exercise, and this is where it becomes of practical value. The first part of the matching exercise is similar to what we just did. Playing the fundamental, and then playing the uh, first overtone, as smoothly and as musically as possible, without movement, singing the note, pre-hearing the note, and letting the larynx do the work. Then we go to the real fingering for the note. In this case, B-flat, played with the side fingering the way I play it. This is the fingering you're going to most likely use. There are times when you will use an overtone fingering for a note, for harmonics and for color, uh, something I'll discuss later in expression, and then color, coloristic devices. But basically, when you play something normally, you're going to be playing a normal B-flat fingering, or a normal C, or an F, or a G, or whatever note it is. So we're really concerned about that fingering sounding really good. 
Now, what is the difference between the fingering of this note and this note? This note, the overtone note, has all the horn covered, especially for low B flat, the greatest note on the horn, really, most resonant. And this B flat, this real fingering, only has about a third of the horn covered. How about for the second overtone of B flat? It's not written here, but F. How about F? F is oh, a little more than a third, maybe half the horn covered. So what's happening is that when I play an overtone note using the low fingering, I get the full vibration capacity of the saxophone, the brass, the deep notes, the deep sound of the horn. Somehow when I go to the, small, to the uh, higher fingerings and cut the bore down, I of course get less vibration and I get a shallower note, not just a higher note in pitch acoustically, but a, not as deep a note, not as resonant a note. The difference between, as vocal teachers speak about, chest tones and head tones. They always say in singing to try to get the head tones, the high notes, to sound uh, as if they have chest tones because the bony structure of the head vibrates, but they want to try to lower it. So they're always saying, they're trying to get the chest to vibrate <clears throat> as it does. And that is a way of evening out your registers. Well, in a certain sense, we're doing the same thing that a vocalist has to do. We want to even out the registers. We want to get that bottom part of the horn up in the high register. But we start out very simple, trying to get the first overtone. And the second thing is the pitch. The uh, thing about the pitch is the uh, saxophone, being a not a perfect instrument, and acoustically not really uh, exact, also, the heights of the, the keys have a lot to do with how the, in tune a horn plays. The neck has a lot to do with it. The, place of the placement of the um, mouthpiece on the cork has a lot to do with it, which, by the way, this shows you quite a bit about whether you're in the right place. You can play the fundamental to the overtone and then count on the overtone being pretty much in tune to the fundamental for the most part. The first B flat is a little bit different. But for the most part, the overtones are in tune. There's been no change of fingering. There's no change of the acoustical properties of the horn. It's as good as you can get, let's put it that way. When you go to the real fingering, with that change of fingering that we've been discussing, you are changing the balance of the horn. This is where intonation problems come into play. What we want to do is find out where in our larynx, because I'm going to stress that tuning is not as usually, uh, when it's looked upon as going flat or sharp in the lip, tightening or loosening the lip. It is in the larynx that you can do a great deal of tuning. So by finding that place in our inner ear, that place on the register where we lock in to the pitch being as in tune as possible to the overtone, which is in turn as in tune as possible to the fundamental, we start to assume that position by habit. This is an exercise that by doing it over and over again, and I tell you over years and years, this exercise starts to pay off where you begin to feel in your larynx how to get the, tune, the tone in tune and also to get that good deep, deep sound, if you like, the chest tones up into the head tones. Let's um, try the uh, first part. So I go from the fundamental to the overtone, then I will match. And when I do the matching, notice the difference in tone, color, and maybe in pitch, depends. <laughs> Many times repeated, back and forth. <laughs> And then finish the exercise by going from the overtone back down to the fundamental. This is the crux of the matter, this matching between the overtone and the real finger. Seeking the color of the overtone and seeking the pitch of the overtone. Each time you do this, it'll be a little different. And years down the road, you start to really get that habit in your ear and in your larynx and that feeling of what it is to lock in on that note. Now, I want to show you one little thing about tuning, uh, an exercise, is to try to play a note, play a pitch. I'm going to take a high B flat, and I'm going to go down a half a step to A, and you're going to watch me not use my lip to do it. First, I will show you with the lip. Then I'm going to do it through my larynx, go a half step down. So we're, we're here, and we want this note. Now, I don't want to do it the unmusical way, which is with the lip. That doesn't sound too good. We're going to do it in here. See if 
going to go down a full step. So you see there's quite a bit of control on lowering a pitch with the larynx. Unfortunately, going sharp is not quite as easy. You can only go slightly sharper. I can't go from B flat to B, really. Not really too much without closing up the reed. Before what I said about the position of the mouthpiece on the neck, listen to the difference of intonation when I pull the neck, the mouthpiece far out. Now that would tell me it's very flat. Probably I'd look and say, oh, it's not in enough. Or vice versa, if it was in too far. So this gives me a place where I can usually find out how in tune my horn is. This is a very good test, by the way, for a new instrument or a new mouthpiece. Test the overtones. A good musician, you always hear him testing the overtones to see if the pitch is okay. How about the higher overtones, the ones where it really makes a difference? In other words, the high notes, which are very shallow on a horn, very hard, the high palm keys, uh, the high C, the high B, the notes that really sound bright and pointy and piercing and unpleasant at times, especially on an alto or soprano. The higher up you go, the, the more harsh it is. How can we get those higher notes to mellow out, round out, have more chest sound, if you like? Well, we're going to do it with the overtones. Let me try now to go from low, let's do low C, to the third overtone off the C, which will be high C, and then match. So I'll be... I'll be looking for... That's okay. I would do that many, many times over, over many, many days and months, and eventually that C is going to start to have the qualities of the overtone sounding C. Okay? A uh, few things to be aware of in this exercise. Most important, you can do this in the mirror and check yourself. Be sure you're not doing a lot of tightening and loosening here. You shouldn't see too much movement. Only the minimum amount of movement at the reed that we spoke about earlier. It is the larynx that does it because you'll never get the higher overtones by overblowing or clenching. It just won't come about. And Another thing that is important in this is the initial note. We didn't talk about this, but low notes, getting the fundamental, try not to have to bang out that low note. Listen to this, for example. You know how much trouble it is to get low notes sometimes. The problem usually is that people drop their jaw. When they go low, they think low. What you have to do in this is think the opposite. Again, vocal teachers, vocal coaches will tell you, when you sing low, think high. When you sing high, think low. This is in order to counteract the natural physical tendency to go with the range. We don't want to go with the range. The range will take care of itself. So when I go to a low note, especially on the tenor, I'm going to try to keep my jaw purposely up. Instead of this. Dropping out the resistance. And the same with high notes. When I'm up in the high, high register, I don't want to be writing up. I want to think down and let the throat come. This is the major exercise in the overtone series. What we have following now is a series of exaggerated exercises. These are very difficult, some of them, but the point here is to really stretch this muscle so that when you go back to play, it's going to be very easy. The first exercise in this set is concerned with flexibility, being able to vary the sequence of overtone placement. Instead of 
going from one to two to three to four, etc. in order. We try to change the uh, progression so that you need to jump around quite a bit. Uh, my first example in this is the third overtone off of B flat to the first overtone. So it will sound like this. <laughs> off of the low B flat fingering. The next one will be the second overtone to the fourth to the first off of B flat, like this. Next one will be the first to the fourth, second, third off of B. Next one, third, first, fourth, down to the fundamental, all off of low C. Of course, it would be nice to be able to do these in slur as much as possible. The second exercise has to do with the matching aspects of overtones. I'm going to go very quickly from the overtone fingering to the real fingering, attempting to get as even a transition as possible between the two notes for pitch and for timbre. I'll do it B flat, B and C and C sharp on the first overtone, and then I'll move up to the second overtone on these and when I do the second overtone of course the real fingering for F for example the second overtone of B flat will involve using the octave key I can leave the octave key on when I go back down at fundamental first overtones <laughs> The second overtone. <laughs> And you can go further up to the third and fourth overtone or even up to the fifth on the B flat. The next exercise concerns playing in the second octave of the tenor without the octave key and playing in the low register with the octave key, the exact opposite of usual. Uh, this is a quite exaggerated situation, of course, not very normal, but you'll see that it makes you have to use the larynx uh, to an extreme degree and it's very good practice. So first, the higher octave without the octave key. And now the lower octave with the octave key open. I'll start from the regular octave to get the feeling. The next part of this set of exaggerated exercises has to do with playing uh, some higher notes, real fingerings. For example, I'll start off with an E flat, high E flat, the palm keys, 
and moving your fingers rapidly through the saxophone as if to play fast scales and notes, but keeping the note and the pitch of the E flat so strong in your larynx that even with all this movement in the tube, in the bore, in the saxophone, I will still be able to sustain that E flat for the most part. Some notes, of course, will jump to other notes. So I play. D. Even without the octave key. High A, altissimo. You see, the fingerings on the bore of the saxophone are almost uh, not important. If I have a very strong feeling in my larynx for this pitch and in my ear, I can sustain it almost no matter what fingers I do. Of course, this is not a natural situation when you're playing, but this is for exercise excellent. I'm going to do a little uh, variation of it, a little slower. I'm going to play a high C sharp, open C sharp, and I'm going to play slowly all the notes below. And you'll see D, E flat, uh, E and F do not work so well, but then from F sharp up, I will still sustain the C sharp. I'll do this a little slower, okay? So, even on B flat, I almost can get to C sharp. Very difficult to do. Good practice. The fifth exercise has to do with playing the traditional bugle call off of each of the fundamentals. Uh, this involves very extensive use of the second, third, and fourth overtones particularly. So we want to get what's written there. Off of B. C. Exercise six has to do with playing overtone fingerings for all notes. And when not using overtone fingerings, using no octave key. Also has to do with using overtones from a higher fundamental than the D. Remember we had the D as the highest fundamental. Now I'm going to use E flat, E, F, G, and so forth, F sharp. I'm going to use other notes as fundamentals just for the sake of exercise. You'll see as, as the exercise unfolds. The top line here is just an example of thirds in the key of E flat. Now this could be any music at all. It can be a scale, it can be a melody. I will show you with some written music afterwards. In this case, it's just a series of thirds, sounding like this. <laughs> fingered normally. Line A is one possible alternative version of fingering. And you'll see that the first E flat, I will say no octave key. Then the next G will be the second overtone of C. The F coming will be the second overtone of uh, B flat and following right along there. So now I'll play the same series of thirds using line A fingerings. <laughs> Line B, same series of thirds with different fingerings. Now you'll see that the second note, the G, will be the first overtone off of low G. The F will be the first overtone off of F. And so on, right down the line, until later on when I have to hit the high D, I will use it as the second tone, second overtone off of G. So we're doing line B now. <laughs> You realize that as I use the fundamentals above 
the good ones. In other words, as, as soon as it gets to above C sharp, the D and E flat and so forth, the overtones off of those notes are not as good and not as well in tune. But it's a good exercise nonetheless. And finally, line C as another alternative fingerings. And you can read right along with me. Still doing these thirds. <laughs> You could take any written music as a challenge, every day a page from any book, here is some classical studies, and just read it with overtone fingerings. For example, I'm going to play the top line here, just the top line of these uh, next four, let me see, five bars, and use overtone fingerings. Uh, I might use B, the B fingering from an E. In other words, instead of, I might use it from an E any way possible to play it with various fingerings, just like we did with the thirds. So... And so on. As a continuation of this exercise where you're reading music and the challenge of uh, coming up with overtone fingerings for that day and for that particular piece of music, uh, I use one of my pieces that I used to play with Elvin Jones in the 70s called the Bright Piece. Uh, you see the key signature is four sharps. And from letter A, I will play with uh, overtone fingerings. First, I'll play the melody of the first two lines without it so you hear it. <laughs> With overtone fingerings. Also, as an extension of the overtone feeling, of course, are the altissimo notes, the high range notes, which are produced by a combination of false fingerings, uh, false fingerings which, in a sense, create what we call leaks, breaking up the tube, and uh, the overtone feeling in the larynx. It happens to be that on several notes, for example, C sharp, by playing C sharp fingering and using an exaggerated overtone feeling, you can get a major sixth above, which would be high A sharp, and with really applying pressure, a fourth above that, or a ninth above the uh, original note, a high D sharp. So I play C sharp, and I'll be looking for A sharp and D sharp. So it'll be this. All with C sharp fingering. There I just added the uh, major six for D sharp, E, and F also. Finally, the last exercise in this series is to play with what we call a double embouchure. And that very simply means to take the top teeth off the uh, top of the mouthpiece and play with just the top lip and the bottom lip and, of course, a little bit of teeth pressure that you have normally. But this is a, a kind of an exaggerated feeling. It causes an exaggerated feeling in the larynx. If you do this for 10 or 15 minutes and then go back to putting your teeth on top, you really feel quite a difference in your larynx. So it looks something like this.
Okay, that finishes up this series of exercises, exaggerated exercises, in order to reinforce the overtone feeling in the larynx and vocal cords. Uh, before we finish with this all-important uh, section of the tape, I just want to go through, for summary purpose, the overall benefits for doing these exercises. The first great advantage here is for evenness of sound from the bottom of the horn all the way to the top. Sometimes when you hear saxophones play, you will notice that they have a very different uh, coloring and different sound in the low register and as compared to the high register. I don't think this is very desirable. One of the things that I love so much about uh, the great, great players like uh, Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, Wayne Shorter, uh, is that I realized after years of listening to them, one thing that was really evident was a very even sound throughout. Of course, colorings and nuance is, is something that's changeable moment by moment, but uh, to get an even tone throughout means that there is some kind of common grounds for comparison, and that is the low fundamentals and their overtones. If you have this as a method of comparison, you in a sense have, it's like having an example, a teacher there all the time for you to use to have a, a really good sound. And of course, the higher you go in the register of the instruments, and as I mentioned before, especially on the alto and soprano instruments, uh, saxophones, the, the sound gets thinner and more piercing, and it's always a challenge to try to round out the high notes. We talked about chest tones and head tones before and vocalists, it's the same kind of thing. We want to make it as uh, even as possible from the bottom to the top. So uh, after having done the overtones and the matching exercises, you can check this by slowly going through the scale of the horn and seeing if you can minimize differences of colorings between notes. I'll go like chromatically up. Of course, after a while, you can do intervals and just try to make it as even as possible to try to get the benefits of the matching overtones into your real playing. So let's start from about middle G. <laughs> Here's the first break, of course, from C sharp to D. There's usually a great change of color. I want to try to minimize that. I might use the overtone for checking. There's another place of change, usually around A or A sharp. Now that sounds pretty even to me. Here is something that would not be as even. Every note sounds different. So we'll use this method of comparison right through the horn. Uh, you can use intervals that you can play thirds, fourths, whatever. Just some way of comparing note to note and listening for evenness of range and of course, as always, intonation. Going further into this is that other aspect of the matching we called timbre, sonority, or color. And this is, of course, besides trying to match the overtone color in the exercise, the fact that you're going through all the manipulations to do this, you're changing every time you're matching. Remember, we went back and forth from the real tone uh, to the real fingering to the overtone, real fingering to the overtone. And every time I do it, I'm trying to make some sort of adjustment in my thinking, in my ear, describing to myself the sound, well, this is too nasal, this is too dark, this is too bright. Somehow I'm creating a picture so that I can correct it in my larynx, and maybe, possibly, I have to do some manipulation at the lip. And as I mentioned, the tongue, which we'll discuss next, there might be some correction by moving the back of the tongue up and down that you'll, find, you'll discover if you experiment. But one way or the other, in all this experimentation with coloring, I'm also finding out that I have a lot of variety of nuance and color to use for artistic purposes. Um, what we're doing is really strengthening the color characteristics of a note by dissecting it into the partials. And when I do this over and over again, I discover wide, wide variety that I might not have known. Now, if you're a recording musician for either classical or jazz, especially when you're playing something either a cappella or an only piano accompaniment, or in jazz situation, a ballad where every note is measured and counted and you can really hear the beginnings and ends in the middle of a note. This is really important for expression. Some of the great musicians in this respect, of course, are Sonny Rollins and uh, 
Again, I mentioned Wayne Shorter. Uh, Charlie Parker was fantastic at this also. I'm going to play a little melody, a little part of In the Sentimental Mood, which always goes to a high A at the end of the rising line. And I'm just going to keep changing the color just for uh, demonstration purposes. <laughs> I'm not using vibrato here on purpose. You see, I can get so many different types of shadings on one note. And, you know, great artistic value in this is being able to really tell a story with a minimum amount of technique, subtlety. One of the great axioms of uh, artistic creation. Another rather apparent uh, uh, benefit of the overtone exercise, and again, this was done right before with the uh, those extension type exercises, is the altissimo. And as I mentioned, the altissimo comes about as a combination of false fingerings, what we call false fingerings, which really are fingerings that break the bore. They're called leak fingerings. Maybe something with this and this, something with this and this. And of course, a lot of these fingerings are in books and uh, people know them. You can ask a teacher to give them to you and so forth. What I did at the time that I was trying to learn these was I took them, all the books I could get, laid them all out, tested all the different fingerings and had to find the one that's right for me because each one is, uh, each fingering might be different on a, the particular horn you have, your particular mouthpiece, the way you play and so forth. So you really have to find your fingering. Uh, but of course, the idea of using the overtone feeling to get the high notes really helps out and, and it makes it possible to come out. Then of course, further with the altissimo is the idea of multiphonics, of playing two notes at one time and of playing a lot of um, uh, uh, these overtone fingerings in the actual process of playing. John Coltrane was one of the great masters of this and really used overtone fingerings as part of his playing in this kind of fashion. <laughs> Now, of course, what I'm doing is, with the overtone feeling and with fingerings, I'm getting the impression of many different notes on one note. For example, here's a B. Uh, to F sharp. So if you can really find a way to do that accurately and it's controlled as Coltrane did, it really can be used for great musical purposes. Another thing I did there was when I went to the altissimo, I used my voice to support. You could almost hear my voice. Uh, in support of the note, it's a certain kind of feeling on the high notes. Instead of this, I get something like and you have a lot of body and a great emotional feeling to those notes. So I like to use that kind of feeling in the high notes. This is all getting your larynx involved in the production of sound for color purposes. And finally, the last and general benefits of this are musical. It is the matter of conditioning your, your ear Remember before I mentioned how your mind and body and ear all are supposed to work in balance and in tandem. And here is a, this exercise of hearing the note beforehand, trying to match the sound, trying to improve the real fingering and matching it to the overtone is really a matter of inner hearing, willpower, in the sense that you hear that inner sound, you go for that sound, and you produce the overtone. And you do it, and your body will respond. The body is very capable of doing all these things that I do. Some of you may find it difficult to do at the beginning, but if you are strong and persevere and concentrate on this, these exercises, on this overtone exercise, it will soon find its way. It's just a matter of patience. It's uh, a matter of the oral imagination combined with physical coordination. And if you do it enough times, it starts to become habit. This is the most important set of exercises that I know on the saxophone. That's why I've spent so much time on it. These are the key to playing. The, this is a way of really finding out how the sound comes out, how it feels, and way, the way you can control it and shape it. Okay? 
Now, there are a few other things we have to discuss. We are sort of up to this area in the Airstream voyage. Uh, we did speak about the embouchure before. Now I have to dress myself to the oral cavity and the tongue position and, of course, articulation itself. After the air leaves the larynx and before it enters the mouthpiece, it goes through the oral cavity. In the oral cavity are the teeth. The position of the teeth is something that we can't change. They are fixed. But the one changeable um, body within the oral cavity is the tongue. And the tongue, for our purposes, is divided into two parts. The front part of the tongue, the edge part of the tongue, which is used for articulation, which we will speak about after. And the back portion of the tongue, which I'm going to refer to as the hump of the tongue. Now, the hump of the tongue, how it is placed within this oral cavity will have a lot to do with the way the airstream is affected. After having been already affected by the positioning of the vocal cords and going to be further affected by what goes on at the lip on the reed, the last little bit that happens is going to happen by the position of the hump of the tongue. First, we'll refer to a little bit of elementary physics. We have an open body, kind of like a cave, and we have an air entrance and an air exit. The goal here is to have the air leave the exit with the maximum velocity as possible, which is the same as the mouth going into the uh, mouthpiece, and with the minimum amount of dispersion of air, as in the oral cavity. We want the maximum efficiency of air. If you have some kind of disturbing body called object here in the middle of this cave area, where would the best position be to achieve this maximum velocity and minimum dispersion? And it would be to place the object in directly in the middle of the open body because then the air is deflected around the disturbing body and recollects with an extra impetus and comes out with the maximum velocity. If this object is raised up to the top part or to the bottom part, the dispersion is more and the velocity is not going to be as much as it is after it recollects around the object. Okay, this object is the hump of the tongue and this cave is the oral cavity. Okay, now I want to describe the various positions of the hump part of the tongue by using letters uh, and uh, vowels and consonants and this diagram of jaws. As you can see, uh, artwork is not one of my fortes, but I think for demonstration purposes you'll get the point of these diagrams showing the position of the tongue. The red is the position of the hump part of the tongue. Uh, we use the words, a couple different words here. I'm going to use the word father. You say father and you exaggerate ah, you get the tongue in a higher position towards the roof of the mouth, towards the soft palate actually. Ah, ah. If you say the word law, aw, 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 hump part of your tongue is more down at the floor of your mouth. And if you say meat, e, meat, e, the e in meat, your tongue is more in this position, which I would call the middle of the oral cavity. The tongue is lightly, the sides of the tongue are lightly, are lightly touching the molar teeth, the sides of the teeth. This is probably the best position for maximum velocity and minimum dispersion as the object in the cave was above. Now, this doesn't mean that you never could use or, or, ah, or really any part of language. If you go through the alphabet, say, g, k, s, ha, pa, wa, all kinds of different um, sounds, consonants and syllables, you come up with all these different positions. And in a certain sense, when you're playing, all these positions are viable for coloristic expression. But the ones that are most common are going to be the lower tongue, the higher tongue, and the middle. Now, what I'm going to do is give you a few demonstrations of why the E has the best velocity. First of all, I'm going to sing an arpeggio in the various positions. And I want you to hear the difference. most body and the uh, best sound of the three. Another way of demonstrating the maximum velocity of the E position is to place the T before each of these, tor, ta, and T, and watch how a flame is extinguished by the E sound. Ta, 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 ta,
tall. T. Now we'll look at the differences in the mouth itself and watch where the position of the tongue is as I pronounce these words. And when you see the E, I'm going to go tongue a few times and you'll see the space that's created between the tip of the tongue, edge of the tongue, and the teeth, and that's where the mouthpiece would go. Fad, a, a. Law, a, a, a. E, e. Di, 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 di. Di, 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 di. E. Now I'm going to play some notes, and especially in the high register, I want you to notice the difference between the E position and all the other positions, the, the difference of sound that I get. Here is lower or higher tongue, not E. <laughs> You can hear that the E position adds a little bit of sheen, a little bit of shine to the higher notes. Now, I don't want you to get the impression from my uh, talking about high tones before that brightness itself is bad. What I mean by bad brightness means something that is annoyingly uh, brilliant or sharp or piercing. What we're looking for in the high notes is some sort of brightness as we're looking for a dark low register. I think that the E position is one of the best ways to provide a kind of shine or, or, or luster, if you like, to the higher notes. It really is very nice. Now again, as I said before, all positions are fine and in the end, for expression, you can use everything you, you, you want. But you should try to practice this E position because it is one of the better ones for the velocity of air. Articulation is one of the main determinants of phrasing, as it is important to whatever idiom you're playing in. Even within idioms, jazz being an idiom, there are different styles of articulation, from very, very abrupt and uh, percussive to very, very smooth and almost legato. I'm going to play a few different examples in that kind of language so you can hear the variety of articulation is possible just as a demonstration. <laughs> And it goes on and on. One of the things that I look for in somebody's playing, besides their sound and their rhythmic feel, is how much variety they have in their articulation, because this is what keeps me interested. Uh, a musician can play the same notes over and over again, but if he changes the way they're phrased, which a lot of that has to do with articulation, you're going to keep interested. And the great jazz musicians are really very, very good at this. And of course, the great composers in classical music, they uh, uh, would enumerate their exact articulation for you, but it's just to keep things changing, because this is really what keeps the music alive and gives it personality. Now, there are many, many ways of articulating, but the most important thing that is happening is that the front portion of the tongue which contains the muscle tissue, flaps up momentarily, stopping the action of the reed. And that is how you begin the note. Now, that closing against the mouthpiece, which results in the beginning of a note, can be done with great force or very lightly. It can be done with a large portion of the front edge of the tongue, or it can be done with the very, very tip, thinnest point. So what we have is two variables involved, which ha are the reed and how much of the reed is tongue, the thinnest part of the reed or the thicker part of the reed as we come down into the mouthpiece, and we have the variable of the tongue area, the thinnest part of the tongue working its way back to the thicker muscle tissue. The E position I spoke of earlier, this E position, besides the, the, the positive value of the air velocity that we refer to, 
Also has a very nice uh, uh, place, does a very good thing here for the tongue in that when you do the E position, you immediately place the tongue at a very advantageous position apropos to the beginning of the read. When you have the E position, it ends up that your tongue is about one sixteenth to one quarter of an inch back from the beginning of the read. So you have the very, very delicate part of the edge of the tongue near the very, very delicate part of the reed. Now, this, can, this, this area can extend up to three quarters to one inch, and that would be for a very aggressive tonguing. And it depends also on the instrument. And of course, a tenor reed is quite a lot uh, longer than a soprano reed. So everything I'm saying about measurements is more for the tenor. For soprano is not going to be quite all the way up to one inch. It's going to be a lot less. The reed isn't even one inch long. Now, first we have to, before we talk about the different intensities of tonguing and this variable of tongue and reed, we want, we want to get that basic uh, position of the tongue when you, when you are striking the reed. It basically ends up that the edge of the tongue flaps against behind the top teeth if the reed wasn't there. And there are a few different words and uh, uh, ways of uh, discovering this motion. I want to come in a little bit closer here so you can see exactly this position. First of all, if you think of it as a clock, and if I turn to the side, think of it more as a 3 o'clock position rather than 12 o'clock or 6 o'clock. That's one way of looking at it. Another way is to say the word, how convenient, articulate. 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 Another nice little word is D-I-T, dit, dit, dit. This is all with the E position, my sides of my tongue anchored against the molars, dit, dit, dit. And finally, another one that Joe Allard always used to use, and he was uh, French, of French descent, and he could say this, of course, magnificently, which I can't do, which is how they say uh, you in French, one of the ways, that one way is vous. The other way is T-U, and there's a certain way of saying that the French have, which I'll try to imitate here. It's T, 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 and then just put your tongue in the perfect place. Now, of course, when you put the reed in between your tongue and the top teeth, the idea will be to get the tongue to hit the reed. A good exercise here for developing a sensitivity to the tongue. Uh, a lot of times I, I think that musicians tongue and they don't really think about their tongue actually hitting the reed. They don't feel the uh, wood. They don't really acknowledge the presence of the reed on the tongue. So I like to do a little bit of a desensitizing, not de, I should say sensitizing uh, exercise, which is to place the edge of the tongue between, exactly between the reed and the mouthpiece, right in that opening, and just do single tonguings. Do this for five or ten minutes. And if you do this, and then you go to the tonguing exercise that we're going to go to, you will really be much more sensitive. I'm starting out right in between. say do that for about five or ten minutes and you will feel the edge of the reed on your tongue. Now we come to the degrees of tongue. What I like to do is consider the tongue and the reed as mirror images. They sort of look alike. Here's the tongue and here's the reed. And I like to divide them into three areas. One being the most sensitive or the edges. Two being more of the middle, more commonly used. And three being the body of the tongue, and more of the body of the reed. Now you could imagine that the most sensitive area, this lightest, most legato tonguey, the least amount of articulation, but still an articulation, would be the number one area of the tongue, the very, very, very edge, the sixteenth of an inch in, and the very, very edge of the reed. You can see I have an area here from one up. Again, it's a tenor reed, and it's different depending on the... Uh, instrument, alto and soprano, of course, would be different degrees, but basically it's a feeling. This is not a scientific thing. It's just to get a feeling of these areas. The number two area and the number two area here are the more commonly used. Uh, in other words, most of the time you're tonguing, you're using that area. The number three area would be the most extreme, 
in, 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 in jazz or actually in a rhythm and blues, they often use something called slap tonguing. And slap tonguing is just that. It is the tongue slapping against the whole part of the reed, the body of the reed with the body of the tongue. I'm going to demonstrate a couple of different ones. Um, first of all, let me do tongue area number one on tongue air, on reed area number one. The most delicate and probably the most difficult articulation. Very, very light. <laughs> Okay, now I'll do the number two area of tongue on the number two area of the reed, the common part, the most common articulation. Now I'll do a little bit of that slap tongue, three on three. Now, for experimentation and for practice and to achieve variety, I'm going to try some different combinations. I'm going to try area number one of the tongue, light area, on area number two of the reed. Now, I'll try area number two of the tongue, back from the edge, on the light, light area number one of the reed. Now I'll try number three area of the tongue, the most thick, the thickest part, thickest tissue, on reed area number two. It's kind of hard to picture, but I'm trying to create a picture of the different intensities. And on and on. How creative you are with this depends on your own abilities, the kind of time you put in, and your desire to really find out about articulation. It is one of the most subtle aspects of playing and of producing a beautiful musical statement. You can go a long way with this. Remember, what we're dealing with here are the intensities as, uh, as provided by the amount of reed area being struck and the amount of tongue surface being used to strike that reed area. You can practice this first on one note at a time, uh, and then move on to two notes, and three and four, and eventually the scales, and you can use a metronome after a while. Remember, each time you do it, you might want to change the articulation for each series of scales, or within a scale, or so forth. So let me run a few kinds of ways of doing it. and so forth. So remember to, uh, des to sensitize your tongue with the tongue in between the reed and the mouthpiece and then try to feel the various areas of tongue and various areas of the reed. Now we are going to move to more of an artistic uh, aspect. I'm going to give you a few examples of expressive devices and how to uh, exercise them. Of course, this is a very open-ended uh, field that we enter now and very, very personal. Throughout the course of this video, you'll notice that I've been stressing that any kind of uh, exertions, strain, tensions that will take away from creativity are to be avoided. And I've been trying to paint the picture of ease of blowing, and make it so that you understand and everything so that you can at least start from a place where it's not going to be that difficult. Of course, I have to say that in the pursuit of artistic license and expression, anything is allowable. Uh, extreme positions that uh, I said to avoid at all costs, of course can be used if you feel and if you hear that sound that will only come that way. David Sanborn is a very good example. He's a popular saxophonist of our time. 
a very good example of somebody who has a very extreme position as far as the neck goes. He plays off to the side, which would seem to put quite a bit of strain on this very sensitive larynx that I've been discussing so much. In this case, that strain adds to the tone, gives a certain kind of uh, emotional expression to the sound that obviously is very popular and very artistic in his case. So anything goes. The point is, within idiom, that you, within the idiom you're playing in, you wouldn't want to do something that is outlandish in that particular idiom. And of course, within your own personal taste and in uh, observance of the uh, rules of courtesy to the musicians you're playing with and the uh, rules of the music that you're playing. This is a matter of taste and a matter of opinion. The list is partial that I'm going to give you. I mean, it's some of my ideas. Here is a place, uh, an area where you can discover your own combinations of uh, devices. You can study other musicians through records and through live performances and observing them and hearing them at the same time. And also just really experimenting and being creative and having fun with it because this is it's an area to have a good time with. Uh, this is the personality of the musician speaking. I use hand movements and body motions and uh, facial expressions to make my point. So we all use different types of motions. Just like we all have our own fingerprints, we all have our own expressions that uh, will make the point that we're trying to make in a conversation. Well, what we're doing now is talking about those particular aspects of playing that give personality to the music. It gives the stamp of who you are when you play. When you hear somebody play, the thing you really like is that, ah, I know that that is Joe Henderson. I know that that is Michael Brecker. I know that that is Ben Webster. It's from the very first note. And that's probably mostly due to the use of personal nuance, expressive devices, and just create creative uh, thinking in tone production. Uh, Discussing expression. I like the uh, idea of comparing a note to uh, the body of a fish with the head, the body, and the tail being the equal of the attack of the note, the way the note is articulated or not articulated, the development, that means the color, the partials, the, that whole overtone thing we were talking about, the timbre, the sonority of the note which is the body, and then the decay is the end of the note. And here is where we apply maybe some vibrato, uh, maybe we squeeze the note. There are a lot of things we can do. At any point of this, these three places, nuance can be applied. Okay. First of all, a good thing to practice uh, for beginnings and endings of notes, just as a separate little exercise, something that is, will, will pay off when you're doing a, a ballad or a very exposed uh, recording. In other words, every note is heard from its beginning and its end is to play what I call, uh, what are called pre-tones and post-tones. In other words, start from air, work your way into a, a, a note as gradually as possible, build up the biome a little bit, and then decrescendo back into air, as lightly and as evenly and smoothly as you can. <laughs> Okay. Uh, a very common nuance used, of course, is the bending of notes. Uh, this is idiomatic to certain styles. Uh, blues styles, of course, it's very, very well used. And uh, the older musicians use it a lot. Johnny Hodges on the alto with Duke Ellington was well known for the way he scooped the notes from flat up to the uh, pitch. Uh, as I said before, you could do a certain amount of this in your larynx, which is a very musical way to get in tune. But for the sake of nuance and effect, you might want to use your lips here and loosen and tighten. You notice my jaw dropping. Well, it's really my lips relieving pressure. Okay, that's a, a, a colorful effect if used with taste. And as with all these expressive devices, the, mount, the, the thing is, is that the device should not take away from the character of the music and the content. The content has to be there, and then the device could be used on top of it. Another very common uh, uh, device used, especially in the older days by the older musicians, uh, Ben Webster was fantastic at this, is the use of subtone, which is the most lip area on the reed, therefore subduing the vibrations. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
By the way, a very good way to check if your horn is covering properly. There should be no leaks. If there are any leaks, you'll <laughs> have a lot of difficulty getting a subtone low B flat. Also, as you heard in there, there was a little bit of an air sound, using air as an effect, or spit. <laughs> kind of a color of the avant-garde, used a lot for strange effects. More are buzzing sound. Uh, growling sound, in other words, use of the voice with the notes, singing the notes, singing another note, all kinds of different things. And of course, the very, very, very high altissimos just screeching out, just calling all the uh, crazy people in. <laughs> and so on. Of course, the sudden use of dynamics, ranging from very fortissimo to very soft, uh, Ghost notes have something to do with this, you know, in, in, in jazz phrasing you often hear a ghost note, be 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 boom, be be do that. It almost disappears, it's not quite there. Well, these sudden, sudden wide ranges of dynamics is very, very uh, uh, effective. <laughs> and so forth. Uh, another uh, effect that uh, I learned from John Coltrane's playing is that of portamento. It's kind of a small gliss. It means that if I'm going to a note, I go from either a half a step below or a full step below or even maybe a minor or major third below and I slide up, not quite like a grace note because I don't really stress the notes. I just, right before I hit the note, I just slide through. So I'll do a few half step portamentos. Uh, whole step for tornamentals. And even longer ones. Combined with glisses. Okay, and another nice effect is using muffled tones and quarter tone fingerings. You know, I was in Israel some years ago and I met a musician who was very into Arabic music and one of the important facets of Arabic music is the use of quarter tones and they have real fingerings for them on their instruments. He had figured out a whole system of quarter tone fingerings on all the saxophones and you could sit down and do it. It usually means playing a note and adding something from the bottom to kind of just slightly alter the pitch, but not, not quite a half a step. And then there are muffled tones. This is more of a muffled tone, playing like an E, and then fingering using the low notes as a different color. That just kind of changes the color of it. It's a little bit like the overtone uh, coloring thing we were doing. Uh, but the uh, quarter tones, See, uh, that's right between F and F sharp. Here's F, F sharp, between, oh. between E flat and E.
you might have a good time with this and try to figure them out on all the fingerings. This is really good when you're playing some, um, well, modal or ethnic type of music. It adds a, a very nice, nice character. And as I said, of course, multiphonics and two notes at a time and the harmonics and all of that. And there are many, many fingerings for multiphonics and many, many people more adept at that than I am. And a great source of this kind of music is the avant-garde saxophonist, uh, the Anthony Braxton, um, Joseph Jarman, and uh, people like that. Many people from the Chicago School of Playing, in jazz at least. And in classical, there are many, many, many great musicians who have great mastery of multiphonics, playing two, three notes at a time. So this is a study of its own. The point is that all of these effects have to be in the service of expression, in the idiom and in the moment that you're playing them. They should not be used just for the effects. This is the big danger of them, as is the same with vibrato. Overusing anything will take away from it and distract the listener, and he'll say, oh, that's, I like that effect, but what did he play? You know. So be careful of all these things. Now let's turn to one very, very uh, important expressive device, and one that's used quite a bit. And Let's analyze it a little bit more than is usual. That is vibrato. Vibrato is the approximation of the ups and downs, natural ups and downs of speech. At first, of course, through singing, where it's used quite extensively, and then through the manipulation of a tone. It is this manipulation of a note by rapid fluctuation and rhythmic pulsation of the pitch and the volume. It is really not a shaking of the up and down of the pitch so much as it is mostly the volume in and out, loud to soft. Uh, the partials in the tone are actually given minute uh, coloristic changes, so minute that it can't be, can't be seen that way, but this is what a vibrato really is. The things that make a vibrato uh, uh, happen are the rate, the speed, and the intensity of the vibration. Be careful when you're doing this of overdoing it and of too much distortion of the pitch. It is really more the volume than the pitch. Uh, vibrato can be applied anywhere in a note, at the beginning, in uh, the head of the note, the body of the note, or the decay. The decay type of vibrato has been uh, known as terminal, meaning at the end of the note. Coltrane was very uh, well known for his use of terminal vibrato, and vibrato is an important part of the saxophone style of many, many stylists. Uh, uh, it is good to practice a vibrato slowly in pulsations, maybe 4 to a beat, 8 to a beat, uh, develop it up to 12 to a beat, and to uh, try to apply it to one note at a time and slowly increasing its speed and its rate. Okay. Now there are many types of vibrato depending on the body part involved. I'm going to trace it from the most uh, obvious form of vibrato, beginning with the larynx, to the most minute and subtlest form, which is to, has to do with the lip. So first the uh, kind of vibrato is where you bounce the diaphragm. And you'll see me moving in and out of the diaphragm or the abdomen area and the tone will be fluctuating that way. That's number one. Uh, another form of vibrato, a little more subtle than the diaphragm, is bouncing the larynx, or the vocal cords, and this is the predominant form used by singers. Next form, we move on up, is jaw vibrato, and this is a, a, a movement of the jaw, actually up and down, kind of a da wa 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 motion. Uh, this was used greatly by the older tenor players, older saxophonists. <laughs> then there is the moving of the um, hump of the tongue up and down, back and forth, towards and away from the soft palate. This is almost like a uh, shaking. And finally, the most subtle form, one that's very good for terminal vibrato, the end of the note, it's just a slight quivering of the lips. So, a vibrato may be if I just do it freely now, go through all these different stages and go from very, very gross, obvious, to very subtle, and controlling the speed and the intensity. I'll do it in the context of something.
It's a very, very subtle form of expression, not to be overdone. There are some other types of articulation available besides the normal tonguing that we talked of before. Uh, that has to do with double tonguing and triple tonguing. These are predominantly used on the flute, not on reed instruments, but they can be effective at times, especially on one note. Uh, double tonguing is the uh, sound of t, k, t, e, k, e, where the front portion of the tongue hits the reed, t, as usual, and k is the back part of the tongue, the number three area, if you like, hitting near the front of the reed, t, k. Triple tonguing is t, k, t, t, k, t, t, k, t. So it sounds something like this. Double. And triple. Of course, triple is a triplet. And then there's a kind of flutter tonguing. A kind of fast, fast uh, uh, movement of the tongue. I, I can't do that so well. Then there is some sort of closing up of the reed. I don't know how to describe this, except that I hear this in Wayne Shorter's playing quite a bit, and that's sort of a, where it seems like the reed is very, very closed and just is opened up slightly to vibrate, something like this. I don't think I have to tell any saxophone players that Reeds and mouthpieces are a little bit of a disease that we are all afflicted with in this business. I spent so much money and so much time trying to find the right reeds and the right mouthpieces. And uh, I'm not saying that it's a waste of time because doing that, I learned more about playing because I had to adjust and do so many things to every time different. But I realized many years down the line, and I'm talking 15 or 20 years after really beginning the saxophone, finally understanding all these principles that I'm laying out to you, that I could pretty much play on any reed or mouthpiece setup. Of course, some feel more comfortable than others, and that's what you try to find. And uh, some are more expressive and have more flexibility, and this is one of the goals that you're looking for, a mouthpiece that can be useful for all the things you play, hopefully. But the truth is that if you understand the principles as I have laid them out, and you practice them and have a good grasp of them, you're going to be able to adjust accordingly to almost any reed and mouthpiece. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't find the right combination, but it means you shouldn't be a neurotic about it and just constantly look towards your tools as the problem when it may be the concepts that are really uh, giving you the problems. Remember that your setting of the reed is important, how high or low it's set. Higher is going to have a different sound than lower. When I want more resistance, I raise the reed. When I want less resistance, I lower it. I find this to be particularly true with plastic reeds, by the way. Another thing that you want to check out is your ligature. This ligature is a rather complicated uh, piece of machinery, but whatever ligature you use, remember that the lower it is, the more open the mouthpiece will feel, the harder the reed will feel, the more high the closer will, will, will feel. These are minute adjustments, but they're things that affect the feeling of the reed in the mouthpiece. There are several considerations in a mouthpiece that should be important. I, these are pretty obvious. Of course, flexibility. It would be nice to have a mouthpiece that would fit a lot of different situations. Now, of course, I don't know what your situation is, whether it ranges from being in a studio, being a, in a, a big band, being a soloist, playing classical, playing jazz, playing funk, playing um, uh, dance music. It all, all could be different and all have different requirements of volume and of whether you're blending with other saxophones, whether you're blending with electronic instruments, synthesizers, acoustic instruments, guitars, etc. So these are considerations, flexibility. It would be nice to have one that fits all occasions. Some people have different mouthpieces for different occasions, whatever suits you. Uh, I think one of the big requirements for mouthpiece is that there should be a certain amount of resistance. Uh, without resistance, the sound is going to be uh, small, uh, probably a bit thin, and just not satisfying. Resistance means something that you have to do a little bit of work on. Now remember, the reed and mouthpiece I have a combination here. A big opening mouthpiece and a small reed is more or less equivalent to a hard reed and a small opening. You understand that? They're more or less equal. But my advice is that the best thing to do is to try to have a mouthpiece that has a pretty much in the middle type of opening. It depends on the brand you have, but something like a, the way Lynx used to be measured, Auto Lynx, somewhere between a six and a seven. Because 
in that way, you have the ability to play loud and strong and also the ability to play soft and subtone. Because, you know, if the mouthpiece is too open, you're going to have trouble getting that soft sound. If it's too closed, you're going to have trouble getting that hard sound. So you want something in the middle with probably a middle-sized reed. Usually that's the best bet because then you can go to both extremes as far as volume and intensity and so forth. In the end, it is probably a matter purely of comfort. I have tried mouthpieces and picked up other musicians' saxophones with their setups, and I still sound like myself. It's like a drummer's. It's incredible. You could have the same set of drums and have uh, Ron, uh, Roy Haynes, Tony Williams, and Elvin Jones play it, and on the same set of drums with the same cymbals, they still sound like their, their own style. It's a matter of touch. It's a matter of how you approach the instrument. So in a way, it, we're going to get our sound no matter what. I've discovered this. That doesn't mean the search doesn't go on. But you want comfort. You don't want to be working so hard that you're taking away from the artistic uh, intention and that you're just killing yourself. I, I had a mouthpiece that was a 10 opening for a while. And I worked and worked and worked. And I uh, finally, Joe, Joe said to me, he said, why are you doing this? You could do all the same thing on a smaller opening. So try to get something in the middle. Another thing that's very important and crucial to the color and the quality of the sound is the height of the baffle. The baffle is the area right below the tip. And if the baffle is a high baffle, curved more like this, the sound is deflected in a way that will uh, cause a brighter sound than if the baffle is dug in a little bit, what we call deeper baffle, and the air goes down and circulates a little more and it has a little bit of a darker sound. All right? And finally, the last thing, of course, consideration is the kind of material that the mouthpiece is. This is a brass mouthpiece made of brass, which is a very, very good material. There are very good hard rubber mouthpieces, plastic mouthpieces, glass. There are even wood mouthpieces, silver, and all kinds of alloys that uh, haven't, have some have been used and, and probably yet to come of combinations of, of metals and, and all kinds of things that make it for a different sound. This is something to consider. Metal mouthpiece has a certain quality to it as compared to a non-metal mouthpiece, and that's something that's a big distinction right off. Finally, adjustments that you can do to a mouthpiece. Well, one thing that I, uh, I do sometimes if I feel that the mouthpiece is that I'm trying or attempting to try is a little too wide for me, too big, that would mean that the opening is too large. So a, a way to give a false sense of a smaller opening is to take, uh, like, let's say, some paper or something, cardboard, and make like a wedge. Put it underneath the reed, put your ligature on, and you can see that the angle will then close a little bit more and you'll have a smaller opening. It's kind of a way of experimenting with a smaller opening. Unfortunately, you can't experiment with a wider opening unless you dig into the mouthpiece. Uh, another thing that some musicians do is they make, if the baffle is a little too low and they want to get a brighter sound, they take some kind of, some people have used things like chewing gum, and they put it into the baffle in order to raise it. Some kind of material into the baffle, glue it in, and see how it feels if you, if you get a brighter sound. This is ways of experimenting without going out and spending hundreds of dollars before you know you have the right mouthpiece. And finally, of course, you can always go in there with a knife or with a file and uh, start to doctor the mouthpiece. There's a great story about John Coltrane trying this on his mouthpiece and uh, really messing it up, and then the next album he recorded was called Ballads. This was in the mid-1960s, and it was a great departure for Coltrane, who had been playing very, very intense music, to come out with the Ballads album, which, uh, in retrospect, was one of his most beautiful albums, and probably one of his most well-known albums. It's a fantastically beautiful album. But of course, it's Ballads, so it's a quite a quite a uh, lower volume level, and supposedly the story was that, well, he, he messed up his mouthpiece trying to fix it, and he, he didn't have one to record with, so it was good for him to record Ballads. I don't know if that's true or not, but this, the point is, if you go in there with a file or a knife, you better be sure you know what you're doing because you're going to change it and you can't get it back so quickly. The other thing is it's not so simple as just, well, I'll open up the mouthpiece or I'll change the tip or something like that because every variable on a mouthpiece affects something else. So as soon as you do one thing here, you're affecting something that you may not know about. I advise you to go to an expert when you do matters like this. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have finished the voyage of the Airstream. We've gone up the river and down the river and stopped at the uh, cities and byways along the way. We followed the air from the abdomen up through the chest cavity into the larynx and vocal cords, the oral cavity and the tongue position, both the front and back, the bottom lip, and it's very important adjustments at the reed, and of course the teeth and the jaw and the corners of the mouth, and finally reeds and mouthpieces. There's no way that somebody can give someone else a sound, certainly not through a videotape, not through a recording, and not really even through a lesson.
standing in front of somebody. The best that a teacher can do, or uh, that an artist, artist can do for someone, is to inspire them, first of all. Second of all, to more specifically correct any things that are very wrong, by wrong meaning tensions that can be uh, eased, leaving more time and room and energy for creative and personal uh, feelings to come through. The idea of playing is to express yourself, to have something to say, and to have fun, to feel good. Saxophone should feel good. You should look forward to picking it up every day. If it's a chore, if it feels wrong, and if it feels painful, I don't think you're playing the right instrument. That's a very important thing to remember. With all this work, it should still be a joy. Self-discovery and improvement should be fun. Saxophone is a natural extension of the body. It is as easy as speaking or singing. Uh, Joe Allard used to say that to blow is to breathe, and that really proclaims its uh, ease as it should be. Uh, I have mentioned before uh, earlier in the tape, at the very beginning of the tape, that there is a book that follows very much the course of the video with a little more detail and the exercise is written out. Uh, it's called Developing a Personal Saxophone Sound and it could be a good adjunct. Uh, there's also another book that I might mention that is not about saxophone but it's about aesthetics and about my personal voyage uh, artistically through jazz and through all kinds of music and how I've arrived at what I have and some of my recordings and uh, basically a diary of my artistic growth. It's called Self-Portrait of a Jazz Artist. And uh, at the end of the tape, you'll see some uh, places available to uh, get both books. Um, I just want to say, uh, have a good time with this tape. I hope to meet uh, you personally at some point, maybe be able to give you an actual physical lesson because uh, there's nothing like having the teacher there in front of you and it would uh, be a pleasure. We're all part of one big family. Those who play the saxophone, they get along with each other very well. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, good luck. Thank <laughs> you.